الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد We had discussed the uh, Prophet's building of the uh, masjids, uh, masjid of uh, the Prophet and the Masjid of Quba, and we had discussed other incidents that occurred in the early months of his immigration. The next major story, which is going to be the uh, topic of today's halaqa, the ma next major incident of the uh, early Madani period is the Treaty of Medina. The Treaty of Medina. And the Treaty of Medina is a very significant, and it's also a little bit controversial. People have interpreted it in many different ways. So what exactly is this treaty and who mentions it? The, one of the problems that we have about this uh, treaty is that it doesn't seem to be mentioned uh, in every single reference book. And those that mention it, sometimes they mention it without a chain of narrators or isnad. So uh, we all know what is the most famous book of Sirah. By now every one of you should know. What is the most authoritative classical book? Sirah of Ibn Hisham, but Ibn Hisham is the summary of Ibn Ishaq. Every one of you should know this, right? So when you go back to the seat of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq mentions the entire treaty, but he says, it has been narrated to me. And between him and the Prophet is 150 years. Right, so we don't have any direct isnad. Uh, other early books sometimes mention this treaty as well, but again, without a full chain of narrators. Uh, some of the books of hadith, so for example, Muslim Imam Ahmad, it has uh, a phrase of this treaty that uh, Imam Ahmad mentions that the Prophet kataba kitaban bayn al muhajirin wal ansar. He wrote a book between the muhajirin and the uh, Ansar, and this book mentioned in it that every one of them would take care of their own debts and their own uh, uh, issues and problems, and there will be islah and ma'roof between them. So, Ibn, so uh, Imam Ahmed mentions one phrase of the treaty. The problem comes, as we said, there is no early book that mentions the whole treaty with an isnad. And this has led some people to doubt there ever was a treaty. So they say there's no evidence for this treaty to have taken place. Uh, however, Many modern researchers say, even if there's no chain of narrators, when you look at this treaty and the language of the treaty, it's a very archaic language, a language that is not common in the time of even Ibn Ishaq. So if somebody were to fabricate it, he wouldn't have fabricated it with such a, a difficult language. And therefore, the majority of, of uh, scholars of our times consider this treaty to be an authentic uh, treaty. And we're not going to discuss every single clause because it takes up five pages. Nobody's going to go over every single clause. What we're going to do is we're going to break up the treaty into uh, four areas or four different uh, issues that the Prophet ﷺ tackled. Number one, the first issue is everything related to the Muslims. Number two, everything related to the Jews. Number three, everything related to the Mushrikun, the pagans. And number four, general treaties for all of these. Right. So we're going to divide this whole treaty into four. And the problem comes uh, that the treaty, as I said, is written in a very difficult language. And it is composed of sentences. That's it. That the Prophet ﷺ said this. And he said this, and he said this, and he said this. And a lot of what is mentioned are the names of tribes that we don't even know anymore. Because you realize that when we say the Ansar, the Ansar are in fact multiple tribes, primarily the Aus and the Khazraj, but there were more than the Aus and the Khazraj. And within the Aus and the Khazraj, there are at least 40, 50 sub-tribes. And most of these sub-tribes, we don't have much details of their names. So this treaty mentions every one of these names, every single name, which is in fact a sign of its authenticity actually. right? And it mentions every one of these names and what is uh, required of this sub-tribe, what is to be done. The same applies for the Yehud. We think that there were only three Jewish groups. No, this is being generic. In fact, there were within these three subgroups as well. Because we have mentioned many times that a, a large tribe is divided into a sub-tribe. And all of this is jumbled up. It's not as if in our time we're used to logical treaties like meaning. Uh, one phrase for this, one phrase for that. In those days, this type of writing has not yet come. In, in fact, even if you read a book in English, let's say 200 years ago, the way that they write English is very different than what we're used to. We cannot follow uh, the train of thought. They're long sentences, convoluted uh, ideas moving here and there. Of course, Arabic is even more of an example, right? Modern Arabs when they read classical Arabic. So the point being, this is a difficult treaty that's probably a sign of its authenticity. What we're going to do, simplify it. How are we going to simplify? Discuss it from a different angles, four different angles. Number one, clauses related to the Muslims amongst themselves. Of the clauses, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, is saying in this treaty that the Mu'minun from the Quraysh and Yathrib, 
Notice here the term Yathrib is used. And this in fact is a sign of its authenticity because right early on when the Prophet immigrated, we would have assumed that the term Yathrib was still in vogue. Right? Right when the Prophet immigrated. We said many times that the Prophet eventually commanded the name Yathrib to be removed. And he said, do not call it Yathrib. It is in fact Medina. But it, take, it takes a while obviously, right? It's not going to happen instantaneously. You cannot change the name of a city. The very fact that the term Yathrib occurs in this uh, treaty shows that he's talking to people who are not used to a new name. So he has to use the old name. And therefore he mentions the believers from the Quraysh and from Yathrib, i.e. the Ansar. The term Muhajir and Ansar hasn't yet crystallized. Right? The believers from the Quraysh and from Yathrib and those who join them are one Ummah. So now he is saying the Muslims are one Ummah. And Ummah, of course, we'll talk about it, but it means group or nation or, or party. And this Ummah, he said, is in and unto itself, i.e. it is unique to itself to the exclusion of the rest of mankind. So the Prophet is saying this is a unique Ummah. You have bonds that nobody else can share. And he then mentions 40 sub-tribes as we said. He mentions every one of them. The, the Muhajirun by name, the Banu Auf, the Banu Harith, the Banu Sa'ida, on and on again. And he says, every one of these sub-tribes will be left with their own responsibilities that they had before Islam. They shall take care of their own blood money disputes, their own prisoners of war, and their own poor. Now this is... Uh, an interesting clause. And uh, in the Islamic state of the time of the Prophet in this early state, the welfare system as we're used to was not national. It was local. If somebody needed help, they wouldn't go to the national level. They would keep to their tribal level. Right? They keep it to a tribal level. So the Prophet is saying, if there is somebody who's in need, Somebody who's poor, who's going to take care of that person? That person's tribe. If there's somebody who needs to be ransomed from a prisoner of war, ransomed, who's going to pay the ransom? That tribe. If there's somebody who has blood money, now blood money is an exorbitant amount. In our times, I think it's 150,000 riyals, maybe like $40,000, $50,000, right? If you, blood money, of course, there's accidental and there's intentional, and each one is its own. Suppose in, in, in the Sharia court, in the Sharia system, if you accidentally uh, kill somebody, manslaughter, car accident, you drive into him accidentally. The Sharia requires you to fast two months and to give a blood money to the person whom you killed. Right? This is the blood money. The blood money is 100 camels or 120 camels depending on the exact type of what you've done. Uh, and this is a huge amount. And one person cannot afford 100 camels. So what is to be done? The process that I'm saying, every tribe takes care of its own. You are responsible for your own. Another clause, all of the Muslims shall unite against those who do injustice, even if it be one of their own. So this means if somebody does dhulm, even if he's a Muslim, we will be united against the zalim. And this actually goes back to the treaty. Which treaty? Who can remind me? The? No, Hudaybiyah is way afterwards. The Hilf al fudud Hilf al fudud Goes back to Hilf al Fudul, that everybody will be united against the Zalim even if they're one of our own. Right? So the process of saying, whoever does Zulm, injustice, we will be united against him. And uh, the, the final clause we'll mention for this, and again, this is very long, but the final clause for the Muslims, that the Prophet said, the protection granted by the Muslims is the same. The word for protection in Arabic is dhimm. And even the lowliest of them can give protection. What is the concept of dhimm? So again, in that uh, Islamic state, how did somebody get a visa to enter Darul Islam? How did somebody get a visa to come inside? Right? The Prophet is saying, every Muslim has the right to give anybody whom they know, this visa. Even if they are the lowliest of them, meaning even if they're not even free, even if they are uh, uh, a slave, even if it's a child who's, who's aqil, a child who understands, like not a three-year-old, but an eight, nine-year-old, right? This is the majority opinion. Even a child who is tamiz, who is mumayyaz, he has the permissibility to allow somebody to come in. And if somebody comes in with that visa, what does this mean? It means nobody can harm him. 
Nobody can harm him. And if there are disputes, it goes to the court of law. But basically anybody can tell anybody else to come in. And this is how the process has made it. That the dhimma of the Muslims is all the same. Anybody can give dhimma to others. Anybody can give protection to uh, others. And this shows us that when it comes to this issue, all Muslims are exactly the same. Uh, and of course the main issue here is that the Prophet is making the Muslims one ummah to the exclusion of all mankind. He said, ummatan min dunin nas. So he's establishing the bonds of the ummah. The second set of clauses are clauses related to the Yahud. And he mentions the Yehud of the Bani Auf, and the Yehud of the Bani Amr, and the Yehud of the Bani this, and the Yehud of the Bani that. So all of the Yehud are mentioned by name, specifically. And there are again, around 12 different clauses. Everyone is mentioning a, a tribe name. The Prophet ﷺ said, all of these Yehud are one Ummah, along with the believers. Ummatan ma'al mu'mineen. Meaning, that is one Ummah, we are one Ummah. So the Yehud Ummatan Ma'al Mu'minin. So they have a type of status, a type, don't misquote me, that in some ways is equivalent. Because it's Ummatan Ma'al Mu'minin. And he then went on, and they shall take care of their own affairs, their own internal disputes. They will take care of their own fuqara. They will take care of their own blood money. Anything that is happening between them, they are in charge of it. Internal crime, internal murder, internal, they are in charge. Unless they wish to come to us, otherwise we have no business with them. Uh, unless it involves the two, the two together. If there's dhulm, if there's murder between the two ummas, now it will go to the higher authority. Right? So notice here, courts of law are semi-independent. The Yehud, you deal with yourselves. We're not going to get involved about your own affairs. Two people fighting, two people slandering, two people stealing, murder happens, that's your business. You deal with it yourself, internal division, don't come to us. Unless it's between the two of us, right? Something happens between the two, then obviously we need to come uh, to uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu said that between the two, i.e. the Muslims and the Jews, shall be mutual support against those who fight the people of this treaty. And the Yahud will spend along with the Muslims as long as they're being fought. Financial obligations when it comes to external enemies are the same. Notice, financial obligation when it comes to domestic affairs are not the same. Your poor, you take care of them, not us. Our poor, we take care of them, not you. Correct? So far so clear. Now suppose somebody attacks. We will spend on defense and you will spend along with us. Both of us will spend for the sake of the protection of uh, Medina. And at times of crises, therefore, the two shall unite and help one another. And the Yahud are responsible for the costs and the Muslims are responsible for the costs. The Prophet also added here uh, with regards to the Yahud, no Yahudi can leave Medina without the permission of the Prophet You cannot, now leaving Medina, what does it mean to leave Medina? Remember, this is not a time where we just move for any reason for our job. No, leaving means changing your citizenship. That's what it means in that language, right? Because again, this is a very different time and place. Where you live is where your tribe, is where your loyalties, is where your passport, it's all the same, right? For us, we have a whole different concept. Now you have to realize, for them to leave Medina basically means renouncing citizenship, joining another city, uh, another. Uh, camp. So the Prophet you, you cannot just do that. You have to inform us. You have to tell us. You can't just go and become a traitor. You cannot just, or, or even leave and become neutral. This must be informed so that we know that you're no longer a part of this treaty. And by the way, to this day, if you want to give up your U.S. citizenship or any citizenship, you must renounce it. If you take up another citizenship and you want to give it up, you need to go to uh, the, the consul director of whatever country you're in and publicly and uh, basically disavow and give back your citizenship. Similarly, the Prophet is saying, if you want to give up this, you need to tell us. Or else you cannot pretend to be a part of ours and another as well. So any Yehudi who wants to leave, he must inform before he does so. Another clause, if any Jew wishes to follow the believers, i.e. to convert, if any Jew wishes to convert, then he shall be helped and protected, and no injustice shall be done to him. I.e., nobody can harm him. He has the right to embrace our faith. Nobody can harm him if he wishes to embrace our faith. So these are some of the 
clauses related to the Yehud. Some of the clauses related to the pagans, the Mushrikun. And this shows us that as soon as the Prophet immigrated, there were still Mushrikun in Medina. We said this many times. There were still Mushrikun in Medina, and they lasted up until the Battle of Badr when the Prophet returned back to Medina. When the Prophet returned back victorious from the Battle of Badr, that was when every single Mushrik realized that we are such a small minority, and now the Prophet has won, we need to convert. So that was when the Munafiqun became Munafiqun, right? Because before this they were Mushrikun. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salud, this is when he converted, after Badr. All of these people converted after Badr. When this treaty is taking place, it's not Badr yet. So there are still pagans. So what does the Prophet say? No Mushrik shall offer protection to the Quraysh even if it is in return for life or money. Nor shall he in any way come between the Quraysh and the believers, i.e. to defend. I.e. the mushrikun are being told, and this is how fair is this? Wallahi, how fair is this? The Prophet is not saying you have to convert. Look at this, they are pagans, they are idol worshippers. He's not saying you have to convert. What he is saying is, your ties of loyalty might feel towards the pagans. Realize, if you're in Medina, you cannot support them physically. What's in your heart is in your heart. But you cannot support them, nor can you defend them, nor can you come between us and them. Stay out of this business. Stay out of international affairs, basically. Or you can call it affairs between Mecca and uh, Medina. And this shows us that the Prophet in, uh, in that stage allowed the uh, Mushrikun to be in Medina. Later on the Madahib differed. Is it allowed for idol worshippers to be living in Darul Islam? This theoretical issue doesn't apply anymore. Uh, but once upon a time there was a controversy. Everybody agrees that Ahli Kitab can live in Darul Islam. Everybody agrees that the Majus, the Zoroastrians, the Parisis can live in Darul Islam. That's what our Sharia clearly allowed. Nobody disagrees about this. There was a controversy. Should we extend the same? privileges and rights to idol worshippers. And some of the madhahib said, yes, we should. And this is also the Hanafi madhab. And as you know, the Mughal emperor was a uh, Hanafi madhab pr predominantly. And this was, that's why it's possible to be a Hanafi and a Mughal emperor. <laughs> Otherwise, it would not be possible uh, to do that. Uh, whereas some of the other madhahib were stricter in this regard. And they said, no, this extension is only given to uh, the Ahli Kitab and the, uh, and the uh, Majus. That's the theoretical issue. But of the evidences of the Hanafis is here. But the Prophet allowed the Mushrikun. And in fact, it seems to be the stronger case that in Darul Islam, the, the uh, freedom to basically be upon your faith is open to anybody. And this is what some of those classical scholars said, and this is the evidence here. That there were pagans, and they uh, were allowed to remain pagan, but with an extra condition. Why? Because... Uh, of course, at the time, to be pagan meant your alliances are with the Quraysh, or with the, the, the people of Mecca. So the Prophet said, you must remain neutral. You're never allowed to take any sides over here. The final set of clauses were uh, general clauses pertaining to all of the people of the treaty. All of the people of the treaty. And these general clauses are, uh, number one, the Prophet said, the interior of Yathrib, once again using the term Yathrib, is a haram for the people of this treaty. We talked about this two, three weeks ago. What does a haram mean? Haram means sacred land. Haram means that which is halal outside becomes haram inside. That's what haram means, right? That which is halal outside becomes haram inside. So haram means sacred because of this. And of the things that are sacred or of the things that are not allowed, who can remind me? We went over a long list three weeks ago. What is no weapons, no weapons that are unsheathed, unsore. You know, of course, you're going to have weapons in your house. You cannot brandish, you cannot take it out. What else? Plucking, plucking what? Plucking trees, hunting. Can't what? No, you can build. You cannot destroy trees to build. The what? Killing, killing, not killing animals. The biha, of course, you must do. But hunting and... So these are some of the things that are haram. These are some of the things that are haram. The Prophet is saying the interior of Yathrib is a haram for the people of this uh, treaty. And he mentions that no wild trees can be plucked and no game can be hunted and so on and so forth. And he also... Uh, delineated or demarcated what is Medina. And, he, and I mentioned before the Prophet said, Al Medina to Haramun ma bayna Ayrin wa Thawr. And in another hadith, ma bayna Lab Bateha. So he mentioned four points Lab Bateha and Ayr and Thawr. Ayr and Thawr are two small mountains. 
Two small mountains, south and north of Medina. Aid and Thor are two small mountains, south and north. And Labbateha are the two Harratain, uh, are the two volcanic plains, which to this day in Medina is called Harra Sharqiya, Harra Gharbiya. To this day, there, were, there are areas that are called Sharqiya and Gharbiya. That's the Harra. So the Prophet ﷺ demarcated four points. And he sp specified these four points are what make Medina Haram. Outside of this is not a Haram. These are the four points. He also said, uh, part of these clauses, Whatever disagreement occurs between the peoples of this treaty, which shall lead to internal fasad, shall be decided by Allah and His Messenger. Muslims and Jews, Jews and pagans, pagans and Muslims, anybody's having a conflict, then it shall be decided by the Prophet. He said, Allah and His Messenger. It shall be decided by Allah and His Messenger. And this shows us the, the ultimate basis of Islamic law, which is submission to the Quran and to the Sunnah. Also, the Prophet said, it will not be allowed for any believer who agrees to this treaty and believes in Allah and the last day to help any rebel, anybody who opposes this treaty, to support him. Whoever does so will have the la'na of Allah and the mala'ika and all of mankind. Whoever does so, Allah will curse him and the angels will curse him until the day of judgment and no good deed will be accepted from him. In other words, to be a traitor to Medina or to Yathrib, to be a traitor to this clause will entail permanent, and this of course meant also execution, that you cannot disagree with uh, or you cannot strive to harm the people of this uh, treaty. And the final point that he mentioned in this long treaty, uh, that whoever leaves Medina shall be safe, whoever stays in Medina shall be safe, except for anyone who does an injustice or sin. And Allah will protect those who are pious and righteous, and Muhammad Sallallahu is his messenger. That's how the treaty concludes. Whoever leaves Medina shall be safe, and whoever enters shall be safe, as long as they haven't done a crime. In other words, you leave peacefully, you come peacefully, we're not going to harm you. You may leave and come and go as you please, as long as you haven't done a crime. If you've done a crime, then that's obviously we're going to uh, take care of that. And Allah will protect those who are pious and righteous. And Muhammad Sallallahu is his uh, messenger. What are some of the overall benefits or points? What is the status of this treaty? Well, let's talk about some of the uh, misinterpretations, if you like, and then we can figure out what is the proper status. Some people, they exaggerate the importance of this treaty, and others diminish the importance, which is the standard case of everything, ifrat and tafrit. Some people go to one extreme, others go to the other extreme. There is a, a paper that was written back in the 80s uh, by one of our uh, leading Muslims uh, uh, here in America, where he basically said it became famous at the time. I'm sure many of you here are not aware of this now, but back then it became very famous in, in uh, Muslim circles, where he basically said that this treaty was the basis of the American Constitution. Thomas Jefferson got the idea of America from this treaty. Right. And, uh, and I'm not joking, this is, this is uh, a paper that is written that, uh, by one of our... Uh, academic leaders of North America. And uh, this is, of course, I mean, this type of mentality, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, to me, a sign of an inferiority complex, to be honest. That everything that is good, you somehow have to link it directly to, we did it, we invented it, right? And this is simply not just unacademic, you become laughing stocks of the people. People start making fun of you, right? It's something that is uh, ludicrous. Now, there's no question that the treaty for its time was very novel, very unique, that certain concepts of it were then exported to the West, and the West then took these concepts and eventually evolved, and yes, but this is like, you know, 20 degrees of separation or something. You cannot just say that Thomas Jefferson read this treaty and he wrote the Constitution based upon it. Well, like this is, I mean, it really it makes us laughing stocks, right? Because they're so different. There's the content, the whole, it's very different. So this is one, uh, this is one uh, the, uh, if you like, extreme. Another extreme are those who try to, uh, the, the non-Muslims who try to read in evil intentions, astaghfirullah of the Prophet that he wants to make the Yahud a separate nation, and he wants to, uh, because we're going to come to now in a few weeks, uh, the concept, uh, it's a very delicate, we need to talk about it very frankly, the accusation that the Prophet ﷺ treated the Jews unfairly is a common accusation, right? In fact, it is understood by non-Muslims. It's not even an accusation anymore. For them, it's a fact. For them, it is a fact that, astaghfirullah, he had it in his mind. 
He just had something, of course, anti-Semitism is used here, right? And so they say this treaty is anti-Semitic. Because the Prophet is dividing the Yahud, separating them, putting obligations upon them, etc., etc. And uh, obviously that's not the case because the same obligations on them are on the Muslims. Exact same. Literally exact same. You must take care of your own poor. You must take care of your own blood money, your own ransom, etc., etc. So this is one extreme. And of course, as usual, the truth is in between the two uh, extremes. And uh, the truth is that this treaty was very significant. It had a lot of long-range uh, implications and uh, that it established the basis of how an Islamic state is run. It established the overall philosophy of how an Islamic state is run. Of the most important concepts that this treaty puts into writing, literally, it puts into writing. And of course we've been talking about this a lot, but now for the first time it's being written down as a constitution. Of the first uh, if you like, important things about this is that the Prophet wasallam is defining relationships based upon theology. And this is completely unique in the history of Arabia. Because he said, the Banu Auf, the Banu Amir, the, basically the Ansar and the Muhajirun are one Ummah. We don't have differences amongst ourselves. In terms of being treated equally, we are one ummah. And anybody who converts to the faith will become a part of this ummah. So what is happening? The old system of lineage, of uh, tribalism, of you are who your father was, is being broken. And now you will be who you are, depending on your theology and your religion. Nobody has any right to come in between you and uh, being a full-fledged member of the Ummah if you wish to convert to the faith. And this, of course, is something we take completely for granted now, uh, in that's how we view the world. Uh, but at that time, it was, of course, very unprecedented. And uh, the, the concept of Ummah being one block or one group of believers, regardless of who your father is, Bilal and uh, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr is a very noble lineage. Bilal and Abu Bakr are the same. This is unprecedented, of course we know this, but the process was putting in, in writing now. It doesn't matter where you come from, we are one Ummah. And by the way, the word Ummah, of course Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاعِدًا right? Allah says this is the word Ummah. The word Ummah, what does it mean, what does it come from? The word Ummah comes from Um, and what does Um mean? Everybody knows, even the non-Arab knows, right? Um, um means mother. And why is Ummah from Um? What has mother got to do with Ummah? Well, the word Um actually, even more deeper than this, the word Um actually comes from Amma. And Amma means to? La. La. This is a derived meaning. This is a derived meaning. Secondary meaning. It's not the Asl. Amma means to strive for. Yes, to strive for. Amin al bayt al haram. Allah says in the Quran, right? Amin al bayt al haram. That you are intending to get there. So amma means qasada. Amma means to aim for. Amma is basically the object of your attention. Therefore, when the child is born, what is the one object of attention? Um. Right? When the child is born, there's one object of love and whatnot. It's um. All of the attention is to the um. So um is mother. Therefore, the ummah are those people who they might as well have one mother. The bonds between them, they might as well just have one mother. Because that's where they're all coming together from. Right? Uh, of course, the, the word Amma is so deep, so the Imam is also the one who is the one leading you in prayer. Uh, because again, he is the one who has that leadership role. Ibrahim is called uh, Ummatan, even though he's one person. Because of the quality of his Iman, he might as well be a whole Ummah by himself, right? The word Ummah has now over 15 derived meanings. But the original meaning of Amma is Qasada. And then from that we get Um, from Um we get all of these other uh, meanings as well. Even the word tayammum, from the same amma, tayammum, a qasada rafa al hadath, i.e., he intended to raise his wudu, not wudu, to raise the status of not having wudu, right? Tayammum is intention, 
Tayammum means to intention. The same, amma, amma ya ummu. Uh, so the point being that the word umma comes from um because the people of the ummah, it's as if they have one um. It's as if they're so bonded together, they are one group or one nation or one family, literally. One family to the exclusion of all the others. This treaty also demonstrates the justice of the Prophet wasallam. That the Prophet wasallam, contrary to what the non-Muslims say, in fact, he treated the, the Jews with the utmost respect. And he gave them their full rights. And from our perspective, they were the ones, at least in the period of Medina, who refused to take these privileges, who kept on making things difficult for themselves. And we're going to come to this uh, throughout the course of the next uh, few months and uh, even a few years, inshallah, when we talk about this, what the Yahud did and how the Prophet reacted to that. From our perspective, there is no anti-Semitism. From our perspective, they were treated the way they were treated because of things that they had done, not because of who they were. And this is not anti-Semitism, right? They were treated because of crimes that they had done. Either they were expelled or whatnot because of issues they had done, not because of who they were. And this shows us, the Prophet is saying, you are one ummah. Notice the treaty says, and this is exactly, I'm quoting from Ibn Ishaq, that al-Yahud ummatan ma'al mu'minin. Now if that is not the height of equality, you are an ummah, we are an ummah. Along with each other, we are two ummahs. This is an amazing respect given to them. Well, Yahud ummatan ma'al mu'mini. You have your issue, you have your religion, we have our religion. And if the Yahud had fulfilled this treaty and they had outwardly lived up to it, the fact of the matter is they would have been shown the utmost honor and they would have benefited the most. Why? Because the Yahud had a lot of things they were doing in Medina. They were tradesmen, they were jewelers, they were traps, uh, craftsmen, uh, they were uh, businessmen, they did a lot of traveling and finances and whatnot. And the success of the Muslims would have meant their success as well. Because they're a part of the community. The raising of the Muslims would have meant their raising as well. The financial input of the Muslims would have meant their financial success as well. And if they had lived up to this treaty, they would have risen along with the Muslims. But from our perspective, and this is what we're going to prove, they didn't live up to it. And they reneged on the promises. They broke these promises. And because of this, the promise was very clear. Do not side with the pagans against us. And that's exactly what the... Banu Qurayla did. That's exactly what they did. This is a promise that is being given the first month they moved to Medina. Don't side with the pagans. And yet the Banu Qurayla did that. So what was coming to them was coming to them. Right? Similarly, any issue between Muslims and Yehud will be dealt with by the Prophet ﷺ. And both of the other tribes, they transgressed upon the Muslims, murdering or, 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 or whatnot, or, or dishonoring a lady of the Muslims as we're going to come to. This was an intra-ummah. Intra the Yehud and the Muslims are getting involved with each other. So they have to go to the Prophet ﷺ for uh, the final reference, and that's exactly what uh, happened. Another benefit of this treaty is that we are seeing that the Prophet's political status has now become a de facto leader. And this is a key point here. He was invited by a group of Muslims. Now these Muslims are so numerous that he can negotiate treaties on their behalf and become the de facto ruler. Even the Mushrikun and the Yahud, they are told that you have semi-independence basically. Right? You have semi-independence, but if something happens that deals with us, you must come to the Prophet ﷺ. And this clearly shows who's in charge. Right? And therefore what the treaty did was to make official what was understood before this. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ is the de facto or the, uh, the, the uh, accepted ruler of the city of Medina. Now somebody will say there's no jizya mentioned, and there is no jizya mentioned. There is no jizya mentioned here. And the response to this is the laws of jizya had not yet been revealed. Jizya was revealed in Surah Tawbah. Hatta yu'tu jizyati an yadin. This is Surah Tawbah. So that is much later on. And therefore, uh, this treaty does not contradict jizya, but it doesn't enforce it either. In that, there's no clause there because that the, the concept of jizya has not yet uh, come. Also, one of the main benefits of this treaty that we derive, uh, especially living in the century that we're living in, and this is the reality of Islam without, without any political correctness, without any appeasement. As you know me, I'm not one of those who wants to appease anybody. The fact of the matter, which is absolutely true from our sharia, is that 
freedom of religion is guaranteed by the Sharia ah to a great extent, not to an unlimited extent. Let us, we have to be fair here. Classical Sharia ah or classical Islamic fiqh, I should say, uh, did not give the types of freedom that the modern secular world gives. The non-Muslims did not have the right to preach and convert others. You have the right to do as you're doing, but you cannot convert others to your faith, right? But apart from that, pretty much everything else is allowed for you. The, the, the non-Muslims are even allowed, this shocks many Muslims to hear this, are even allowed to manufacture and sell alcohol amongst themselves. This is well known. The books of fiqh explicitly mention this. So much so that many books of fiqh discuss the issue if a Muslim is married to a, a Christian lady, is he allowed to stop her from drinking khamr? And the majority say, no, he's not because that's halal for her. That's halal for her to drink. It's haram for him. He can say, you cannot have it in my house. That's his right. Right? But he cannot prevent her from, because the point is, like in those days, the Catholics, they all drank khamr in their own churches. To this day, they drink wine. It's a part of their rituals. Right? As you know, you should all know, drinking the wine is a part of their rituals. So the Muslim, the majority of fiqh, in fact, dare I say all four madhabs, but I'm not 100% sure, but I know for a fact the majority of them, and I'm pretty sure it's the four, but uh, I don't want to say this un, uh, categorically, say that it is not allowed for the Muslim husband to stop his Christian wife from drinking outside of the house because that's her sharia. And he has no right to enforce on her. This is the type of freedom that Islam allowed. That you have the right to be even pagan in this early stage and no one is going to force Islam uh, down your throat. And the irony of ironies is that uh, we are accused of being intolerant and we are accused of, of not allowing other faiths uh, to, you know, the, the freedom. And yet, wallahi, without any... Uh, Mujamala, without any you know political correctness or whatnot, if you compare our track record with theirs, it's unbelievable how they could have the audacity to say that we are religiously intolerant. It's unbelievable, and we need to be very, we need to be very familiar with this. That we cannot allow people to make fun of our faith in this manner when they don't even know their own faith. They have no right to tell us that our faith was intolerant when. Western powers and Western nations, frankly, were the most religiously intolerant in the history of humanity. And there's, and I'm not being, this is a fact. Even the Chinese, even the Mongolians were more tolerant than Western countries were when it comes to religious differences. And this is something any neutral observer can, can, can mention. I mean, this goes back even to, forget the, uh, the Roman emperors persecuting the Christians, even when Constantine converted to Christianity, right? Constantine is the first Christian emperor. When he converted to Christianity, what's basically the first thing he did? He adopted a version of Christianity, which is now the official version. All types of Christianities go back to Constantine. He outlawed all other Christianities, Christianities that actually had truth in them. Those that believe Jesus Christ was the Messiah, not the Son of God. Those that believe that Christianity is not a new religion, because most of the Christian converts were Jews. And for them, Christianity was Judaism, with believing in Messiah, which is what we believe, right? Constantine came along, you should know all this by the way, because we live in this environment. Constantine came along, and he adopted a narrow interpretation of Christianity. He made it the state religion, then what? He outlawed and banned anybody who disagreed with him. And that is why people had to flee. This is the beginning of Christian persecution by other Christians, right? Constantine forced everybody who disagreed to either, you know, be killed by the sword or get out of here. So Arius, who was the main opponent of Constantine, and Arius did not believe in the Trinity. Arius did not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Arius' version of Christianity is very similar to Islam. Very similar. And Arius was the main opponent of Constantine. Arius had to run away and go down south. And it is said that he went down to what is now Abyssinia. And it is said therefore that the ruler of Abyssinia uh, was uh, aware of, it is called the Arian, uh, uh, the creed, Arian creed, because Arius is the name of the person. So this is beginning. Throughout medieval times, the church killed, and I'm not exaggerating, millions of people. The Catholic Church, we're not talking about Jews, we're talking about fellow Christians. Right? The, the Roman Catholic Church could not tolerate dissent. Before Martin Luther, 
They already had started killing. There were so many different uh, groups that came about uh, at that time. Uh, there was uh, a group called the, the Huguenots, the Huguenots in the what, 13th century. Uh, Tens of thousands of people killed. This is before Martin Luther. Uh, the, uh, the Anabaptists as well in Denmark and whatnot. Uh, again, 20, 30,000 people killed. Uh, the, 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 the wars that took place between the Catholics and the Protestants. Even Martin Luther had to run away. Why did Martin Luther run away and, and go to uh, Switzerland? Because the Roman Catholics wanted to kill him. Right? This is not intolerance of another religion. This is intolerance of their own religion. And it is ironic that somebody like even John Locke, John Locke is uh, 1689, 1690 or so, uh, John Locke is the main intellectual uh, whom the founding fathers of this country read. And American uh, political science is basically Lockean in nature. How we view or how America views political science is from John Locke. John Locke's writings were read by Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, uh, uh, Adams, all of them they read uh, John Locke and they consider him to be the greatest uh, philosopher of the time. John Locke is actually criticizing his fellow Christians for their intolerance, right? And he is saying that why don't you look at the Ottomans or the Turks, he called them. The Turks allow people of different sects and different faiths to come and live. Why do you have to be intolerant amongst yourselves? Look, he is putting the Ottomans as the role model. Can you believe this? Right? This is John Locke writing that, why don't you look at the Turks? And he's writing at a, at a time when, of course, uh, people are not being tolerant of other types. As you know, our founding fathers, why, why, why did they come to America? Why did they flee? Because of religious persecution. Who was persecuting them? People of their own background, right? And therefore, John Locke is writing that, why don't you look at the Turks? They allow people of all different Christianities, all different creeds, uh, Jews to come and live amongst them. And this is an amazing testimony, we can say, right? This is an amazing testimony about the reality of how the Sharia views uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, freedom of other faiths. Also in this treaty, getting back to the treaty now, we notice an interesting point and that is, uh, the semi-independence of every single group of people. The Prophet ﷺ said, the Yahud are their own ummah, they take care of themselves. We're not going to interfere. The Muslims are their own ummah, and of course the Prophet ﷺ is going to solve their issues, and the Mushrikun are their own. And this is amazing because what the Prophet ﷺ is giving them is he's giving them almost independence within the state of Islam. Almost independence. You are responsible for yourself. You're responsible for your own affairs, your positives and your negatives, right? Your crimes and your issues, all of it will be dealt with internally. However, the Prophet said, when it comes to uh, the issues of the state, when it comes to the issues of the entire community, now we are one group. And therefore, some have said, and these are all modern terms, so to try to read them back, is, it has its positives and negatives. Some have said that the system of the Prophet is a federalist system. By, by this, what is a federalist system? That basically, there's semi-independence. Right? The Prophet was not going to get involved in the affairs of the Jews. He wasn't going to get involved in the affairs of the idol worshippers. They are semi-independent unless they have an affair that is domestic in nature. If an external threat comes, then we will be united. That's what the Prophet said. If the pagans attack, we will be united. And everyone will send forth its army or its troops or its financing. We will all come together. And it is true to say that this type of government was unique in the world at the time. It is true to say this, right? And there's an element of truth, therefore, that this type of concept was later exported uh, to other places and areas, and then things develop from there, uh, as, uh, as I already said. So, the type of uh, government that the process instituted was one that was pretty minimal when it came to the state getting involved in the direct affairs of the quote-unquote citizens, right? Because that will be independent upon every single tribe. And that's a very interesting notion, which is, as I said, similar even a little bit to how America has the various states, if you like, even, right? The mind you shape will be dealt with, with the states. Of course, in those days, there weren't states, there were tribes. And so the chieftain of the tribe will take care of his own internal affairs, and the Prophet ﷺ will take care of the entire area of uh, Medina. Another, of course, uh, benefit, we already know this for now, it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or a non-Muslim, if you do an injustice, a wrong, a dhulm, you're not going to be protected. 
If you steal, if you cheat, if you lie, the Prophet ﷺ said, even if they are a Muslim, anybody who does a crime or a sin, then he shall be dealt with. Simply being a Muslim will not get you off the hook. And he actually, the, the part of the treaty says, all of the Muslims will be united against him. No one can shelter a murderer. No one can shelter a criminal. Somebody who has committed a crime, everybody has to unite against the crime, regardless of whether they're a pagan or a, or a Muslim or a Jew, it doesn't matter. Crime is crime regardless of the uh, regardless of the religion of the one who committed it. Again, these are novel ideas for the time. It was unheard of for the time. The Prophet system is being very forward thinking in this regard, of course. Uh, another uh, thing that some people have derived here from this uh, treaty is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ accepted the legal norms and the customs of every tribe. In Arabic this is called Urf. He accepted the Urf or the legal customs of every tribe as long as it did not conflict with the Sharia. And he allowed the tribes to deal with their own internal laws as long as it didn't conflict with the laws of the Sharia. And of course, one of the primary principles of our religion, uh, I've said this before, every one of you should be aware, there are five major uh, qawaid fiqhiyya, or rules of fiqh that govern fiqh. There are five major rules that govern all of fiqh. One of them is al-urfu muhakkam. And that is, in the absence of a shari ruling, the culture of a people will be given precedence. In the absence of a shari ruling, the culture, how they typically interact with one another, this will be given uh, precedence and taken into account. Al-urfu muhakkam. How people interact with one another, the sharia in fact does take this into account. And I've given uh, some examples of this in previous talks that, uh, that uh, we've we given about the seerah. Now, from this uh, treaty, let us now take a look back and see what exactly has occurred uh, since the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ comes, the first thing that he does is he builds a masjid. And the masjid is of course the basis of Tawheed, the fundamental of religion, reminds them of the purpose of life. He then establishes the bonds between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. Firstly, even before the treaty, by physically pairing them together, right? The Mu'akha, we talked about that. The Mu'akha, literally pairing them together. And then, the third point, he then makes this entire treaty where he ratifies the status of the Mu'minun, the status of the Yehud, the status of every single group, and he then forms the first Islamic State, or the first, if you like, federation, and how it will interact with uh, one another. Uh, there's uh, more to be said, inshallah, we'll continue, but we have a respected uh, guest uh, over here, so we want to uh, hand the uh, floor over to him and to Dr. Bashar uh, to be able to tell us about uh, a project that they're doing that every one of us should be involved in. So inshallah, we will resume next uh, Wednesday, bi'idhanillahi ta'ala. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. As uh, Dr. Stone is uh, setting up his uh, art display, uh, we'd like first to, to welcome him and, uh, and all of you probably know, uh, I'm sure all of you know who, who Dr. Stone is. Uh, pastor Steve Stone is the pastor of our neighbor church at the Heart Song and, and uh, from uh, day one, from before this building was erected and when we had uh, just purchased a piece of land and, and uh, we were just nervous coming into the neighborhood. We all know how Pastor Stone uh, put a banner out there just before Heart Song that we just drive by every morning and every night and it says Heart Song Church welcomes the Memphis Islamic Center to the neighborhood and that just started a, a friendship that day by day is just getting into a new level and a new horizon. Uh, Ramadan before last, this building was not completed and, and we wanted a place to pray in and, and graciously Dr. Stone opened uh, the doors of the church and, and many of you actually, most of the people that I, the faces that I see here, we were praying at Heart Song and you all know how that friendship not only resonated in, in our congregation and in their congregation, but it also went 
national sort of in today's term went viral and a lot of people started talking about it and then went international and then before we know it we had uh, messages from all over the world, we had TV crews from Bahrain and Uganda and, and people are interested in this friendship. Now this friendship is, uh, alhamdulillah, all, all praise be, uh, be, be to Allah, is, is getting uh, actually stronger and stronger and we have uh, started uh, uh, a project together and I would like to, to present uh, Steve to, to let you know about where we are. Many of you probably know about uh, some of the, uh, the, the general outlines of the project but I want him to talk about this because uh, to be honest this was his, his dream and his, uh, uh, his thought and, and uh, we were just very happy to, to go along with this beautiful ride. So Steve, welcome in, in, you. in your, your old place. And thank you, thank you. Uh, it, it makes me laugh to say it was my dream. My, my dream was a couple of swing sets and a grill and a <laughs> but this thing has really taken off uh, now that uh, the foundation has been formed from uh, people from Heart Song and MIC have come together and and we're now uh, a recognized 501c3 by the state of Tennessee and the IRS and all this and and uh, it's an amazing project that continues to develop and unfold this drawing here and we've got brochures if any of you haven't had a chance to get one I want you to have one because it's got a, a picture of this in there and talk some about the the philosophy of the park and why we're doing this together we're trying to create opportunities for people of all races cultures and faiths to make friends just to be good neighbors to each other the project's going to be about eight acres there's approximately four acres on the south side of the road that the foundation has bought there's uh, about four acres on the north side of the road and one of the key parts of this project to us is that circle in the middle, I don't know if you can see the purple circle right there in the middle, that's a tunnel which we hope uh, to build under Humphrey Road so that all of this is one park. Uh, the perimeter will be fenced so that you, no child or family can cross the road. You won't be able to. You'll have to go through the tunnel. And the other thing is to, to make sure everybody knows this is not two parks. This is not a Heart Song Park and an MIC Park. This is one park and we want it to be one experience. Um, but we're in the process now of trying to get our act together so we can begin to approach some of uh, the foundations and corporations that we hope will help us fund this. This is about a five million dollar uh, project and we, we want it to be a world-class monument to friendship that even if people never get to come here across the world they know there is such a thing as, as a park uh, dedicated to friendship and the whole idea for it came from uh, not just our friendship but how our friendship caught the imagination of the whole world you know we continue to hear from people across the globe about this that want to know about it and, and uh, talk with us about it so that's where this whole thing came from and uh, we've uh, got this big event coming up Saturday you wanna yeah so Saturday in number one don't panic the five million dollars is not coming from <laughs> nor heart song, nor heart song. <laughs> Just relax <Yeah. laughs> So what, what we're doing is we're applying uh, for different grants, different foundations that actually want to support projects like that. But, and and they're, they're actually give in the millions. Many of you probably are familiar with uh, Shelby Farms and the playground there. It costs about, about four and a half million dollars. And it's all donated by different foundations. And, and there's a lot of support uh, nationally and internationally for projects like this. Of course, we have to do the initial work purchasing that land and, and showing that the community is interested and vested in a project is really a condition uh, for those uh, for those foundations to to buy into it if we don't believe in it they they're not going to believe in it if we don't support a project like that they're not going to support that with millions usually they would want us to kind of do the initial work do the do some of that and then show how vested and how interested we are in it uh, I'm not going to speak too much about this because because this Saturday we have a beautiful event that's happening. We're going to have a picnic, a combined picnic, Heart Song, MIC, and actually we're inviting guests from other congregations all over town to come and, and, and showcase this and show our friendship 
physically and literally uh, in front of everyone and then show our support and, and, and to the project and I'm, I'm very positive that all of us support it because this is not just going to be next door to us wh where we going to enjoy it and Heart Song is going to enjoy this, this beautiful monumental park and it will be really in, available literally in, uh, to, to our children and our families but this means a lot more and it can bring a lot more to our community. It's, it's both congregations putting back to the community and showing our friendship. Um, uh, to, today's uh, the Saturday picnic. It's going to be on May the 5th on Saturday. and We start in at noon. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go for two to three hours. There will be uh, food. Uh, high quality and, and you know some of the vendors that are providing that uh, a very dear brother to us and among others uh, there will be games for the children there will be a lot of activities and uh, we would like to invite all of you to, to really show the support so I don't know if, if any uh, I don't know if Sheikh Yasser wants to comment on, on this a little bit you know uh, uh, actually yesterday I was uh, invited to the uh, Memphis Rotary Club uh, to give a talk there. The Rotary Club is uh, a club of very influential um, leaders uh, of the Memphis community. Uh, I was pointed out a number of people who were CEOs of companies and PBS and the uh, owner of uh, Commercial Appeal. Everybody was there just pointing me out. And so this is like a, a room of who's who of Memphis. And I was invited to speak, basically. And uh, somebody asked a very, at the, at the end, a very difficult question, which basically was uh, about how tense the relations are between Muslims and between Americans. And uh, to respond to that question, I simply pointed out, yes, people can make it difficult, but uh, it can, they can also make it easy. And I gave I gave the example of Heart Song and, uh, and MIC. And I gave a very passionate defense and plea of uh, the fact that this is the way forward for America. And the fact that this uh, genuine hospitality sparked a worldwide uh, positive attention. And frankly, we firmly, both of us, firmly believe that uh, when there is that sincerity, then, you know, Allah and, and God is, is going to bless that. that. That's the whole point. That what you do something genuinely and sincerely, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept that and give a uh, reward for it. And this is the reward that we saw. That the entire community of this country, of this land, of even international uh, news agencies came in and they uh, showed a positive sign. And when I gave that defense basically, uh, the entire audience erupted in applause. Later on somebody commented that uh, they've never seen, the regular guy, they've never seen the entire Rotary Club, these are big shots here, then you know, break up in applause at the response to a question. It was like the first time it happened, like, you know, when I, and the, the point was that once again, it was about this uh, cooperation that we have. I firmly believe that this uh, type of project is going to place Memphis squarely on the map of North America. That there's no project quite like this anywhere else in North America. And it's something that we should be very humble and proud of, that something so small that nobody ever thought that something like this would become uh, a national attention or bring about so much positive. Nobody ever thought this. Now here we have a five million dollar uh, park that we're all going to benefit from and it's right going to be right here, you know. Uh, in fact, it's probably going to help us not having to do any of the things in our land and now you not have to do things. So we're going to save some of that money, guys. Think about it that way too, right? We won't have to do things over here because they're right here where they're literally across uh, the door from us. I think honestly, it's, uh, it doesn't require anything. It's common sense here. This is a, a cause that there's nothing but good in it for us, for our community and neighbors, for the people around us, for the image of Christian-Muslim relations. Uh, this is something that's khair ala khair. I mean, this is positive, inshallah. So I hope that whatever we can do to help out. And like we all said, we're not going to raise the money, but we do have to show the support. I mean, these big corporations, they, they, they don't just throw their money out. They want to see that you're sincere and dedicated. And in order to show us that the, the in order to show them what we're doing, uh, you know, we need to basically have our act together. We need to show there's community to support. I'm I'm sure that we're going to have to raise a little bit of a kernel uh, to get it all started and rolling. We've already done a little bit of that, but inshallah, the, the bulk of the money is going to be coming from uh, many corporations uh, in this regard. So inshallah, do what we can to help out. And uh, I'm very positive that this will become a, a, a beacon of light for the entire uh, community.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, all of that well said. And, you know, the, the park, we, we're going to have this, uh, uh, the, the brochures have some of the details. This is just sort of the beginning of the dream. There's water park, there's different features for the children, for the family, for the adults to, to have fun, to play, to interact. There's a cultural center. All of these great ideas, uh, inshallah, God willing, will, will happen and happen very soon. Again, we have to stick together. We have to show the support. So I invite you not just to come there, but just to get on the phone and, and invite your friends. Invite your, your Muslim, Jewish, Christian, all your friends to bring them with you to show them what this is all about and to get their support for this. Uh, we have to raise some money for that, and, but, but a, a, really a dollar raised for this project is going to bring uh, probably a hundred dollars for sp from sponsorship for for corporations but we just have to do our, our role just come and have fun look at it and and it uh, doesn't hurt if you bring your checkbook with you but <laughs> but uh, you know just but come anyway with without it uh, you know you're welcome bring your friends bring your children and, and inshallah let's continue our friendship I don't know Steve if you had any any other words to say no, just just that we continue to be uh, honored and humble to be your friends, and and for that to to be such great, well received news uh, in the community, which is most important because that's where we live. But then nationally and internationally, uh, the response we have gotten from day one, uh, we had hoped maybe 51 percent. We prayed let 51 percent uh, like what we're doing. It was over 90 percent. That, that like what we do and so it shows the hunger in the world for uh, friendship and and so to be a part of that and have it right here is as Yasser said it's it's a tremendous blessing to all of us thank you very much we're gonna we're gonna post this up front, uh, back there so but but please uh, feel free to get a brochure we we have plenty of them so take take all all you need give to your friends really let the word go out. Uh, come out in your workplace and uh, your family, whoever you think of, this is a very positive thing. We're 100% behind it, and I hope you will also be 1000% behind it. Thank you very much. I know it's time for prayer, so I don't want to hold things up too much. <laughs> we have time for QA. Okay, good. Okay. Do, do you have QA about this at all? For, for a <laughs> Round of applause for Steve Stone. Of Oh, yeah, the brochure is very well <laughs> So we have around 10 minutes left uh, for Isha, inshallah. So if there are any, no point starting the next uh, phase. So any questions and others? We did the Jews and the non Muslims of Medina accept uh, the Prophet as a ruler, not necessarily as a prophet, but as a ruler. They were forced to. There was no question of it, and then they signed the treaty. They agreed to the treaty, right? So there was a sense of the majority of the people of Medina wanted the Prophet to be in charge. The majority of the people, they were now at this time, the majority were already Muslim by this time. So the Yehud cannot uh, stop that from happening now. And so he is negotiating on their behalf, and he's also, remember, there, were, there was also a sense of optimism even from them because they were tired of the civil war. And that's again as Aisha said that Allah gifted the Prophet with that civil war. That even the Yehud had been fighting amongst themselves, remember. There was civil war even amongst them. That two of them were on one side and one of them was on the other side. And therefore because of this uh, at that point in time there was no outright opposition, no sign of hostility. In fact, if you look at the earliest revelations at that period of time, they seem to be very upbeat and positive about the Yehud and the Nasara. Right? The f first half of Surah Baqarah, for example, right? You know, so uh, Allah Azza wa is, is uh, telling the Yehud that there's many flavors. Uh, you were the best people. Once upon a time, we chose you. You know, Allah Azza wa says, Faddalakum al al Multiple times he says in Surah Al Baqarah, right? So clearly there's this sense of. Uh, here is your prophet you've been waiting for, this is time to accept. Of course, Allah knew that wouldn't happen, uh, but the Prophet was hopeful that it would happen. 
That is very clear from the seerah. That the Prophet ﷺ himself was optimistic. And he expected uh, them to convert, like Abdullah ibn Salam, and there were a few others as well. And then slowly but surely things began to sour, and uh, things became uh, more and more difficult until finally what happened, happened. So that's a separate case. Yes, Bismillah. Based on this treaty, in, in terms of this, like in non Muslim communities like Saudi Arabia, many in Saudi Arabia outside Mecca and Medina, your fuqhi opinion, not political opinion, about like establishing like Madura like, Ibad, like uh, churches, or uh, from fuqhi standpoint. So, well, from a we need to discuss this in two different ways. Number one, what does classical fiqh say? Number two, is this one of those areas where there's room for change or not? Right? As for the first issue, what does classical fiqh say? By unanimous consensus, the Ahli Kitab are allowed to worship in Dar al-Islam. And the Yehud can uh, have their synagogues, the Christians can have their churches, and we do not interfere. Even if they practice what we would consider shirk inside those churches, we're not going to interfere. After all, uh, they will worship Isa ibn Maryam, they will make dua to him, they will call out to him, this is their haqq, this is their right to do it, uh, as long as it's within their churches. Uh, also, they're allowed to, uh, according to this, uh, the, what the Prophet said, and in fact this is what uh, the, the Ottomans continue to have it up until the 1860s or so, the millet system. Uh, I forgot to mention, or we didn't have time. The Ottomans literally had something just like this called the millet system. And the millet system basically said that the sharia of the Yehud will be their own sharia, the halakha. And the Christians will have their own. So family law, by the way, India and Israel still have these two. Sorry. India and Israel are the only two countries in the world where these policies are still there somewhat. And that is, depending on your religion, you must declare your religion. Depending on your religion, you will have different family laws, different civil laws, different divorce laws, not different criminal laws, by the way. In Israel and in India, uh, if you're Muslim, your family laws will be taken to an Islamic Qadi. And if you're Parsi, if you're Christian, it'll be different ones, you know. And uh, in Israel as well, if you're not even just, if you're Orthodox versus Conservative Jew, you'll be going to different court systems, right? Uh, and this type of philosophy, and a little bit of it, of course, I'm not comparing, it's apples and oranges, but the Prophet system had it, in that they have a separate system. So, classical fiqh, definitely they had that uh, freedom. Now, the issue arrived, now there were also some restrictions. Of the restrictions is you cannot proselytize, you cannot convert others to the faith, right? Of those restrictions, you cannot blaspheme in public, right? What you say in your church is that Uzayd ibn Allah and Masih ibn Allah, that's in your church. You cannot go to the public marketplace and then say the same thing over there. Nor can you make istiza of Allah and His Messenger or whatnot, this is not allowed, right? So there's not ultimate freedom of expression. And freedom of expression was curtailed, and as you know, classical fiqh has the penalty for uh, sabbullah and sabbul rasul to be uh, qatil. This is, there is no question about this, that the, uh, the, the books of fiqh have this, and there are very strong reasons for them to do so. Now the question arises, do we have room for... Uh, fine-tuning these types of laws or not, here we have a spectrum. Here we have a spectrum of opinion. And this is beyond the scope of myself or any one alim. But any major ulama of our times are having their positions about this. And uh, I mean, I don't mind saying this. I know some of you will not like this, but this is my position. Take it or leave it. Uh, that when it comes to these types of laws, it doesn't make sense to apply them in a nation state. Because Sabbullahi wa rasulihi is something that deals with multiple factors, right? And proselytization and speaking out publicly about your faith. It deals with multiple factors, one of them being uh, the supremacy of Islam. Now, if you have a country that is not judging by the laws of Islam, but rather by a secular democracy, let's say, right? Whether that's kufr or not is a whole different issue, but I'm saying this is the status quo. I'm Pakistani by ethnicity. My parents are from Pakistan, right? Pakistan, we can call it Islamic Republic. We all know that the laws of the country are a mixture of British laws and French laws and a little bit of Sharia here and there, right? This is the reality. For this country to have a system of blasphemy laws, it's a little bit 
circular in logic. It doesn't make sense. Because it's not based on fully the Sharia. It is a somewhat secular nation in that the rights of a Christian and a Jew and a Muslim and, and, a, and a Hindu in Pakistan will be the same. Whereas in classical Islamic law, that's not the case. The rights of the Muslim are different and the rights of the others are different. So you see my point here is that, very frankly, this is such an emotional question, people don't want to even listen. The, dear, the, the minute you mention something like this, they become a little bit uh, you know, riled up and angry. Uh, but I'm being very frank here that if we had a perfect Islamic system, that is one thing. But we don't. We don't have anywhere in the world up and running. We have attempts to do so. If this is the case, then uh, people like Tariq Ramadan, like others, are asking for re-looking into these things and, and rethinking them through. Uh, even Qardawi has many fatwas about this regard, about the, the uh, minority rights, that frankly a lot of his fatwa are modern ijtihads. Right? They, they don't come from classical fiqh, but he's giving them much more freedom and laxity than are found in classical books. Why? Because modernity calls for it. Right? So this is one of those areas that I believe we do need ulama to come together and pronounce what is allowed and what is not allowed. Uh, in the meantime, it's a theoretical issue because we in, here in America are not calling for such a radical change. Right? But classical fiqh, without any doubt, it allows Christians and Jews the right to be Christian and Jews and the right to not be interfered with in their rituals and their worship and even their Sharia which is in fact much more than what uh, like here in the West we cannot have Islamic courts right if you think about it the that guarantee and right is more important than the right to blaspheme in public right think about it yeah, and, uh, and so the Sharia is giving them more rights than what Modern Western nations give to their minorities. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Back and forth, right? Any question from the sisters? Okay, for the go ahead. I, uh, I wanted to ask about the treaty. Um, one, one side that, that treaty is against the Muslim community in the forces contention between the Prophet, so and the Jews and the Ibn Ishaq and others do not mention any sabab, any context for this treaty. Ibn Ishaq says that the, the, the question was, was there anything that sparked this treaty? And uh, one of the problems, as I said, is that this treaty is in fact not even mentioned by many of the early books. So much so that even great medieval scholars like Imam al-Zahabi and Ibn al-Qayyim and others, they barely just gloss over it. And it seems as if many people did not appreciate or understand the importance of this treaty. Right? Therefore, even the classical books, Ibn Sa'd and others hardly mention it. Right? And, and uh, Al-Waqidi hardly mentions it. So, uh, it's only mentioned in its entirety by uh, Ibn Ishaq. And it is mentioned in bits and pieces by others. Uh, and therefore, it seems, and Allah knows best, that the significance of the treaty was not fully appreciated. Uh, I think we, because we're living at a time when this is such a sensitive issue, and we're wondering about how should we run countries, and what is the rights of minorities, and whatnot, for us to find this treaty is very uh, heartening, is very optimistic, is very good. So we find so much to benefit from. But for the people in early Islam, I, I guess for them it just seemed like a long list, which as I said, it is a very complicated list, and they couldn't find much benefit. Allahu Adam, uh, your question uh, is one that I have not found any reason or answer to in the books. What was the reason why the Prophet did it? It's just foresight, it just seems to be wisdom. From listening to you, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a treaty, it sounds more like a constitution for the new established state. And if it, 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 was there any uh, geographical differences between where the Jews resided and the rest of, uh, of Medina? The Yehud lived inside the Haram, most of them. There were a few settlements outside. But the bulk of the Yehud were inside the Haram. Ayr and Thor are huge distance. Even if you go by car, it will take you at least 20-25 minutes by car. It's not a small distance, right? al Madina to Haramun ma bayna Aydin wa Thawr. Right? And Ayr and Thawr are literally opposites apart. Uh, Ayr is behind mountain Uhud. And Thawr is... Uh, Beyond, beyond Quba almost. So from the mountain of Uhud to basically Quba, this is a huge distance. The bulk of uh, the people lived within this, and there were small pockets outside of it. 
So there was no geographical space. Distance? La, no, no, no. No. I mean, did they sign on it and say we accept it or it just, it's, it sounds there was no... No, this, there was no such thing as signing is a modern thing. People didn't sign their names on anything back then. Right, signing is a modern thing. There doesn't seem to be any... There doesn't seem to be any negotiation. Seems to be an agreement, like an agreement between all of the parties. So, uh, yes, go ahead. Could you please elaborate on the non-Muslim who cannot enter and live in Makkah and Medina? Is it Islamic law or is it Saudi law? <laughs> you guys really want controversial questions today, huh? Huh? Well, I mean, I no, don't shy away from controversy. I believe that if we phrase uh, questions intelligently and responses intelligently, we have nothing to be, uh, you know, worried about. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, there's a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, that uh, the Prophet ﷺ on his deathbed said, أَخْرِجُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ مِنْ جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ Right, on his deathbed, he said this, that I wish to get the Ahli Kitab out of Jazirat al-Arab. But he didn't actually do it because he's on his deathbed. And so uh, basically Abu Bakr was too busy doing the wars of the Ridda. So Umar ibn al-Khattab was the first person to actually put this into the law. I.e. to execute it. Right, to execute it. And he put a number of conditions that the Ahli Kitab can only come, number one, if somebody invites them in. They need the permission to come. Right. Number two, they must come temporarily. They must come temporarily for business or whatnot. They cannot be permanent uh, over there. Uh, and he also allowed, by the way, for them to be uh, uh, non-free slaves. He can also come in. Uh, remember, who was the one who killed Umar ibn al-Khattab? Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi. How was he a Majusi in Medina? Because he was a slave. And so they weren't that strict with uh, the slaves in this regard. So uh, classical fiqh therefore took this hadith uh, and the Shafi'is and the Malikis and the Hanbalis all agreed that the Ahli Kitab cannot permanently reside in Jazirat al-Arab. They may temporarily go and then there's a khtilaf between the three. To what extent? How long uh, can they actually enter Mecca and Medina? Uh, because Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ نَجَسٌ فَلَا يَقْرَبُ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ بَعْدَ عَامِهِمْ هَذَا This is in Surah At-Tawbah, right? And that's the last big surah to be revealed. Uh, basically, one of the last surahs, not the last, one of the last surahs. That, uh, that the mushrikun are najas, so فَلَا يَقْرَبُ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ Let them not come close to Masjid Al-Haram after this year goes by, right? So we have this ayah which says Masjid Al-Haram. And then we have the hadith which says min Jazirat Al-Arab. And so the Hanbalis, for example, they made a tarqib between the two and they said, Masjid Al-Haram, they can never enter. And the Jazirat Al-Arab, they can enter with conditions. And this is the predominant opinion, right? And so, by the way, to this day, you can be a Christian and Jew in Jeddah, in Ta'if, in Khubar, in Dammam, right? Uh, Riyadh. But when you're driving to Mecca, there's a big sign. Huh? There's a big sign. And they check. Huh? The shurta, the taftish. What do they check? They check iqama, which basically says what? What is your religion? Right? So, uh, this is the position of the Hanbali madhab. And the Shafi'is, I'm also sure, have a similar thing. I think, Allahu alam, they allowed even the mushrik to enter, uh, the, uh, the kitabi to enter for a reason. Uh, for a reason to Mecca and Medina. Uh, and the only madhab that disagreed completely with the entire premise is the Hanafi madhab. And they have their reasons and they said that uh, uh, they may enter uh, Mecca and Medina unconditionally. Right. So then the ikhtilaf comes. What is Jazirat al-Arab? This is the whole ikhtilaf. Every book of fiqh discusses what is Jazirat al-Arab. Right. And in fact, believe it or not, uh, no, this is not the majority opinion that Yemen is not. Exactly, yes. And so the majority opinion is that ma ba'da Jibal Tihama is not Jazirat al Arab. Right? And that is beyond uh, uh, Tihama. 
Okay, so Jazirat al Arab itself is an ikhtilaf. What is Jazirat al Arab? Uh, a very important personality in the modern country of Saudi Arabia has the position that the entire Arabian Peninsula is Jazirat al Arab. So he was asked a question about Kuwait and he gave a response about Kuwait because, from his perspective, uh, this entire peninsula is Jazirat al Arab. But this is not the majority opinion. And the majority opinion basically would say Jazirat al Arab is more like Central Arabia. He just called Kharaja Makhraj al Ghalib. Jazirat al Arab Kharaja Makhraj al Ghalib because even when he said this, there were Yahud in, 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 in Yemen. Sah? Even when he said this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were Yahud in Yemen. In fact, they were not even, يعني, Yemen was just under the Islamic State. Right? And they continued to live there up until recently. Yes. Correct? So, Allahu A'lam, يعني, with great respect to this person, but I don't agree with that position in its ta'meem, in its complete, uh, you know, uh, extrapolation. And Allah knows best. But again, this is, I have to also say, this is legitimate fiqh ikhtilaf. Yani we have these opinions. There were scholars who said the entire peninsula from Bahrain and Oman and, and uh, Najran and everything is Jazirat al Arab. There were scholars, it's not a modern opinion. And this is an ikhtilaf that we're never going to solve. How are you going to solve this? Yani you're always going to have the spectrum of opinion about what is Jazirat al Arab. Wallahu alam. But that uh, hadith was regarding the Yemen and the so uh, the issue comes now, are the Ahli Kitab uh, Kuffar and Mushrikeen? <laughs> this is a whole different issue, you're bringing up a whole other controversy. And as for them being Kuffar, there is no question that they are. In our terminology of fiqh, uh, the Ahli Kitab are a subset. Calling them Ahli Kitab doesn't mean that they are not. They are, right? Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, kafar, no, not just laqad kafar in the qalu, but lam yakun alayhi the kafaru min ahli al kitabi wal mushrikin. This is the I was thinking of. Lam yakun alayhi the kafaru from two categories. Min ahli al kitabi wal mushrikin. So ahli kitab wal mushrikin put together are alayhi kafaru. Okay. Also, the issue of shirk, there is no question that. Uh, Trinity is not Tawheed and anything that's not Tawheed is and therefore so uh, this ayah has not been understood to apply only to pagans because these groups also have committed Kufr and Shirk but in any case this is theoretical for us to be discussing in Memphis right we are splitting hairs here what they decide is their decision and honestly I have been asked this as well and I am not somebody to shy away from controversy I'm very frank as you know and I say look yani what their position is whether it's valid or invalid we are not calling for it in America we're not asking for it to be implemented anywhere and it's not relevant to us as a as a minority it's not relevant to us it's not and I think we do ourselves a disservice when we try to take on every single cause around the world you know Allah didn't ask you to defend everything around the world we have our own problems to deal with right and you if, if some honestly I've been asked this question I say well go ask the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia I mean, if that is his interpretation and his fiqh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm not the one propagating it. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to support it because it's not relevant to me. I'm not criticizing, but I'm not supporting. That's the position they have to do, they have to justify, and they have to answer. Uh, but I will tell you from Islamic fiqh that, and by the way, this is something even I disagree with, with this is that um, it, depending on how you understand Jazirat al Arab, that's the whole issue here, right? Th if you understand Jazirat al Arab to mean Central Arabia, what this means, therefore, is that outside of Jazirat al Arab, i.e., peripheral Arabia, you may build churches and synagogues. Correct? Because the rules of Islam clearly say that they may have their places of worship. Correct? There's only one exception that's Jazirat al Arab. There's only one exception from the three madhabs. The Hanafis don't even have this. So if you're Hanafi, which uh, if you are, then khalas, you say, look, that's not my fiqh position. End of story. Right? It's, uh, that's his school of law, not my school of law. Right? I don't, I don't believe this position. But even if you're not within the Shafi'i, Hanbali, and Maliki schools, if you follow the position that Jazirat al-Arab 
is a particular region within the peninsula, then what is outside of this region, i.e. Uh, Najran or, or Qatif or, or, uh, or Dammam or something, uh, that then you will say those rulings don't apply over there. Right. And that's a whole other issue. But again, this is theoretical, not relevant to us here in, in Memphis, inshallah. Uh, with those very controversial questions. Today, for some reason, you guys wanted modern political science. So, inshallah. Uh, uh, sad announcement from uh, my part, actually. Uh, maybe it's not so sad. I don't know. Uh, we only have two weeks left of the Sira. We're going to be having our summer break. Uh, and I'll be going to Houston uh, for June. And then when I come back in July, there's only two months for Ramadan. So we'll do something for Ramadan. So we'll have two more weeks of Sira, and then the school is finishing. Uh, so many of you are also going as well. So in June, we won't be having uh, the Sira. And then uh, in July, we'll announce some programs for Ramadan. So we will be resuming Sira, uh, inshallah, after Ramadan. But we have still two weeks. Don't just, still two weeks left, inshallah.